Hey what is up guys, finally Bitcoin and Ethereum getting some positive momentum and moving upwards. In this video we will take a look at what is going on with Bitcoin but mostly we will focus on Ethereum price action and on the update of the roadmap to Ethereum 2.0. First let's take a look at Bitcoin price action. The Bitcoin's price had some breakthrough and finally trading upwards. The current Bitcoin price is at around $8,900, just few bucks away from 9000 bucks. In June of 2019, Bitcoin reached close to $14,000, but since then the trend was facing down. I don't know if you want to call it a bear market, but I would call it a major correction. Bitcoin dropped from $14,000 to the lowest point of 2019, which was at 6600 bucks. That's more than 50% decline. We were in the declining channel for almost 7 months. In my last Bitcoin video, some viewers were not so happy the way I drew the declining channel. It was exactly 10 days ago, in that time Bitcoin was at 8300 bucks. God damn, I drew my line the way I want to draw them, okay? In the end, it's better to be approximately right than exactly wrong. But regardless how you draw those damn lines, it seems like Bitcoin price broke out of this channel. It might be a great indicator for another market cycle. There is another interesting correlation that I found between market cycles in 2017 and in 2019. Let's take a look at 2017. We had a major bull market run when Bitcoin went from $1000 all the way to $19,000 by the end of the year. Then it dropped quickly respectively. It dropped from $19,000 to around $6,000 to $7,000 range. Consolidated for a while, then it dropped again, slightly above $3,000. But now let's take a look what happened last year. From $3,000 Bitcoin gained upper momentum and reached $14,000, similar to 2017 bull market run. The difference is, in 2017 Bitcoin went parabolic and the last year it wasn't really the case. Therefore, the drop in price behaves slightly differently, respectively. In 2017 we have seen a rapid drop because of the parabolic move, but in 2019 Bitcoin was steadily declining in that descending channel. We can also draw a parallel in that in 2019 we have seen some major rapid drop from $9,000 to 6600 bucks. Just like in 2018, Bitcoin dropped from $6,000 to $3,000. Since then, in 2018, we have seen consolidation and another bull market. Here we go again, we see consolidation and breakthrough, which might continue trending upwards. In this case, the patterns are a bit different and the time frame is different as well. But I wasn't looking for exact patterns, I was looking for some similarities. Ok ok, let's take a look what is going on with Ethereum. ETH current market price is slightly over $170. In December of 2019, one ETH was trading around $120 a coin. It's a nice $50 gain or approximately 40% increase within one month time frame. Similar to Bitcoin, we also see this declining channel. But in ETH case, this channel does not mean shit. Here is why. That declining channel turns into small and steady downtrend, which can turn around anytime and it looks like it is turning around. This video is presented by Dudex. Udex is reliable and trusted cryptocurrency exchange with up to 100 leveraged swaps. It has a new and unique feature where you can amend your order price by dragging and dropping on the chart. It is very useful and easy. Use the link in the description box below, sign up and get $10 bonus. Deposit 0.1 BTC, get $50 bonus. Deposit 0.2 BTC and get $100 bonus. Now let's move on into fundamental aspect of Ethereum project. Let's see where we are with the update of Ethereum 2.0. And the best person to talk about this is Vitalik Buterin himself. 
over the last couple of months uh, in the Ethereum one, uh, 2 phase 0 spec has been uh, getting clo uh, uh, finalized. So right now it's in the stage that basically says final except for security audits. And like, there have been security audits happening. There's this uh, wonderful uh, Japanese formal verification team that's been uh, looking over the Casper FFG uh, fork choice rule and they've been uh, posting some uh, suggestions for how to, fi how to fix some issues on ETH research and that's been uh, really great. Um, there's um, and the interoperability workshop that I unfortunately uh, could not be at because I was um, all the way on the other side of the world from that here in Israel. And uh, basically there were just seven uh, Ethereum 2.0 implementations that everyone got together in a room and they managed to get all their clients in sync and talk to each other. And Yeah, and it's basically the spec is finalized with, um, except for things that come up during the, these uh, security audits. And um, the clients are now talking to each other. The next step is basically to make sure that they can maintain a public network at scale. And that's the thing that I think the uh, client developers are starting to focus on now. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely enough difficult parts to it because we're talking about potentially hundreds of thousands of validators that are aggregating a huge number of these uh, BLS signatures once every few minutes. Mm -hmm. And doing this involves like aggregating some messages on subnetworks, publishing them to another subnetwork, putting them together into a block. And like this complexity is going to be necessary anyway for sharding because like the unique thing about sharding is that there is too much data to kind of broadcast all of it in a single peer-to-peer -peer network yep. where everyone downloads it. But it's it is something that we're starting. Well, we've already started to work to work on for quite a while. We're continuing to work on, and and it's been really interesting though. This is uh, things that uh, the developers have been uh, working on more than myself. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, for my own side, I also am focusing on phase one and phase two quite a bit. According to Vitalik, the roadmap to Ethereum 2.0 and the first part, which is phase zero, has been finalized. Those of you who do not know what is phase zero, phase zero is basically the name given to the launch of the Beacon chain. The Beacon chain will manage the Casper proof of stake protocol for itself and for all shard chains. Next question would be. What is the incentive reward for the validators and how much return can they expect? Yeah, so there's been a lot of misconceptions there. So like, for example, there's people throwing around the uh, like 1% uh, percent statistic. And in reality, right, the, the maximum reward is 1.7% per year only in the case where like pretty much literally everyone is staking. Um, and so, in the case where a smaller number of validators are staking, the the return the rewards go up quite a bit, right? So, like for example, if you go down from 100 million ETH to 10 million ETH, then we're talking about dropping from 1.7 percent to around five, like something like 5.5 percent. Okay. Go down to 1 million ETH, it goes up to 17 percent. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there there's like some fraction of fees that you would get. And so, all to get like. It's it's going to hit an equilibrium, and like it's I guess it's important to kind of keep in mind that like the goal of proof of stake is ultimately to kind of minimize the costs of uh, r keeping the blockchain in consensus. And so no, we're not going to like have numbers that are just a kind of a giveaway to anyone who is willing to lock, willing to lock the wreath up in a um, in a box for a few weeks. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So. Like, like we think that the chain uh, will totally have enough security if 10 million ETH is validating. And like if 90% of people think that validating is not worth it, then that's still 10 million ETH validating. Okay, I got it. You are confused. And you need more explanation. Let me explain. Just stand by me. The incentive reward is not fixed. It's not like you're buying government bond and you should expect 1.5% rate of return annually. Here, the economic incentive is slightly different, and I really like the math behind it. Let me explain. For instance, if 100 million ETH is taken and validated in the network, maximum return you can expect is 1.8% annually, which is still better than those shitty government bonds. But for example, if 10 million ETH validated in the network, the max return you can expect is 5.5% annually. 
and if only 1 million ETH validating the network, the max return you can expect is 18% annually, which is quite awesome. But here is why this economic incentive reward makes sense. If only 1 million ETH validating the network, it will make sense to pay them higher return. Since they take more risk comparing to when 100 million ETH validating the network. If 100 million ETH validating the network, it means that network is much more secure and validators take much less risk. You can be a validator with only 32 ETH. But once again, there is no fixed rate of return. It will depend on how many ETH validating the entire network in general. How scalability will be achieved? Yeah. Out Second layer scaling solutions are an interesting uh, topic. And I um, wrote that in a slightly controversial blog post a couple of weeks ago where I basically said that layer two protocols that have data off chain are just fundamentally going to have a hard time generalizing. Um, and like there's some economic reasoning behind that. And once you understand it, like you would realize why it's just hard to make to, to go from like channels and lightning and plasma for payments to channels and payment and, and lightning and plasma for EVM contracts. And the kind of layer two that I advocated for is these layer twos that have data off chain but computation um, on chain. And that with this kind of layer two, it's much easier to re get full generality back, but at the same time still get these very huge uh, scaling gains. And if you do this, then you know, you'd basically have this kind of in interesting equilibrium that's uh, halfway in between being a layer one application with all the benefits and costs and having a layer two application with uh, co the costs and benefits of that. Um, and I think when the base chain becomes more sharded, like, yeah, there will be less need for like fully off-chain layer two things. I think there will still be value for layer two things uh, because they do provide gen genuine efficiency. And even things like repeated payments, for example. Do you, so do you think they're going to serve specific niche, I guess, components of, say, a DAP, for example? Like, yeah. I know, like for example, um, you've mm -hmm. got Axie Infinity that has, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's the participant layer of, mm. uh, of their game, which only runs on Loom right now. Um, yeah, I could definitely see them being more niche. Okay. And I could give some examples of niches. Um, one niche that I think people really underrate is uh, light client server markets. And they basically, you know, you know, people talk about, like, we, we need full nodes to be incentivized so more people run full nodes. Yeah. But like, the incentives can't come from the protocol because if the incentives come from the protocol, there's just too many ways to cheat. Like, you could run a full node without actually providing anything and, like, what are you uh, helping? But you'd still get the rewards. But well, the right way to do this is basically you have uh, uh, you create a market where clients that want data, so that want Merkle branches, receipts, state entries, whatever, on shards that they haven't already downloaded can talk to um, server nodes, so nodes that already have that data and basically get Merkle branches and verify them. And we have a market where basically clients connect to servers through payments channels. And the reason why payment channels are good is because like clients are going to make a series of many requests to the same server and you get a lot of efficiencies out of that, and then this creates an incentive for servers to actually exist and be providing this uh, data to light clients. In 2020, the goal of Pushing Research starts Ethereum scalability solution. There is a lot of money being pushed into the research about solving particular obstacles for layer 2 scaling solution. The Plasma research team identified several office achievements as a key, including creating Plasma cash flow implementation, realizing the general plasma specification and coining optimistic roll-ups. This served primarily to make plasma sidechain into the fully-fledged blockchain supporting smart contracts as opposed to just limited money transfer capabilities. What are the terms of private Ethereum? So ZK Snarks in general have really made a huge kind of leap of progress just over the last three weeks yeah. in a way that a lot of people aren't realizing. 
Right, so you have Plonk, this uh, ZK Snark protocol with a single universal updatable trusted setup, which basically means you have only one uh, trusted setup that you run it once and it works for every program. You don't need to do a new trusted setup for every new program. And also the setup is updatable, which means if you have an existing setup, you can join it and you can make a new setup, which is secure if either the original one was secure or you're secure. And... What this means is that it's really easy for thousands of people to participate. Okay. Um, and so Plonk uh, basically is a CK Stark protocol that has only this very minimal trusted setup requirement. Um, also, there were some announcements recently about um, what's called polynomial commitment mm -hmm. protocols that have like really reduced security assumptions. And the other interesting thing that's happening inside of Plonk is that they've basically achieved this kind of layer separation where you have you break up a snark into two parts, where one of them is um, arithmetization, so basically converting a, um, pro a a computer program satisfaction problem, so like give me an input that gives this output, into a series of structured math equations, and then a polynomial commitment scheme basically is a scheme that lets you kind of encapsulate a huge number of values into a single value in such a way that you can still like, kind of make improved mathematical claims about them. Mm -hmm. And these two things, you can kind of innovate on them separately, right? And you can kind of mix and match, right? You can take Plunk, cut out the, their trusted setup, add in another trusted setup, add in Fry, add in like what uh, this new in an order group based thing, whatever, whatever. And so basically, it's kind of like mix and match. You know, you choose the trusted setup based on like basically your political ideology. Like, are you afraid of discrete logs? Are you afraid of trusted setups? Are you afraid of hashes? Let me know what do you guys think about Bitcoin and the roadmap to Ethereum 2.0. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below, hit that like button and subscribe.